If you're listening to this podcast, it means you're hungry. Hungry for change, hungry for growth, and ready to have a major breakthrough in your business. As a partner or founder in more than a dozen businesses that do more than $5 billion in revenue each year, Tony Robbins has learned from the best in the world, the Steve Wins, Mark Benioffs, and Peter Goobers, what it takes to be successful. Whether you've been in business for decades or are just getting started, it's important to get help from someone who's been there, someone who's going to coach you through it. That's why Tony is offering a free one-on-one -on -one business strategy session from one of his top business strategists, a $600 value, completely free, no strings attached. If you're listening right now, go to TonyRobbins.com slash CEO and sign up for a free session with a Tony Robbins trained business strategist who's helped business owners just like you to overcome their obstacles and set them on the path to success. In a world where 96% of businesses fail after 10 years, you must know how to anticipate and how to take advantage. Take advantage of this offer today. In this episode of the Tony Robbins Podcast, we're bringing you to Business Mastery one more time, where Tony recently led a panel discussion with the business leaders behind some of today's fastest growing companies. For this episode, you're going to hear from one of the founders of a company that changed the travel industry forever. When's the last time you booked a trip somewhere? Where'd you stay? Was it a hotel? Or did you opt for the alternative and rent a room, maybe an entire house, from a local? The idea of staying in a stranger's home may have blown your mind a few years ago, but today it's not just a standard practice, it's actually the preferred accommodation for tens of millions of travelers across the world. There's just one company to thank for that, Airbnb. Airbnb started as a simple solution to a pressing problem. Co-founders Joe Gebbia and Brian Chesky couldn't afford rent, so they opened up their San Francisco apartment for guests to stay in. They soon realized they might be onto something bigger than just a way to avoid being evicted. So, along with their old roommate, Nathan Pilkarczyk, they started to build it into a business. That was nearly 10 years ago. Airbnb has been through a lot since then. It was by no means a straight path to success. In fact, they launched and relaunched a number of times. They found themselves up to their ears in debt, and they were rejected by investors over and over. They were very close to flatlining on more than one occasion. So how did they persevere? How did they turn a floundering idea into a global business that now operates in more than 34,000 cities and 91 countries. It's now estimated to be worth $30 billion. Let's go to Business Mastery to find out. So we talked beforehand, before we joined Facebook Live and so forth for, for about 45 minutes, we shared some of the businesses that you began before and how all of you have the common element of you decided what the outcome was. Right, you know why you were doing it. You didn't know how. None of you knew how, and all of you figured out the how, which is really. I always tell people, it's the tyranny of how that keeps people from doing things. If you know what you want with such precision and with enough certainty, you've got strong enough reasons, you find the way. But let's talk about how Airbnb started. Will you share some of the story? Start with, if you would, the dilemma you found yourself in, <laughs> and losing a roommate, and how this came about. Oh my goodness! Well, as you saw, it, you know, our mission is to create community so that anyone can belong anywhere. So that when you travel anywhere in the world. You can move from feeling like an outsider to feeling like an insider. And we do that through great design, through community and the guest host relationship and, and the platform that you offer is homes anywhere you travel in 191 countries. Yes. So where we are today started with very humble beginnings. It was October of 2007, and uh, I convinced my friend from college, Brian Chesky, to move from Los Angeles to San Francisco. I had this premonition that if you ever put us in the same room, we could create something big together. We had proved that on campus, and now is out in the real world. I really wanted to find out what we could do. So he moves to San Francisco. We both quit our jobs at the same time. And there's all this excitement in the air of what are we going to come up with? What could we possibly create? And all of a sudden, <laughs> this letter comes in the mail from the landlord. And I'll never forget what it says. It says, Dear Joe, your rent is now 25% higher. So I go to Brian and we run to our online bank accounts and suddenly we look and see that we have a math problem. <laughs> the rent went like this and our paychecks went like this. We have literally just a few weeks to figure out how to save our apartment. So we put our thinking caps on and we came up with a bunch of harebrained ideas. And one day I'm sitting in the living room and I'm looking at it, the website for a design conference coming to San Francisco. And on the, the, the webpage, it says, all hotels sold out. 
I'm thinking, man, that's a bummer. You know, people come in last minute, and I look up around the living room, and I think, we have all this extra space. Hmm. What if we just hosted people during the conference who need a place to stay? So I pull an airbed out of the closet, blow it up, send a note to Brian, say, hey, Brian, what do you think about this? He loved it. And together we said, well, let's think about a whole experience. We could host three designers. We could get, go get two more airbeds and actually cook breakfast for the guests, pick them up from the airport, give them a, a subway pass in San Francisco, maybe a map to the city. And before we knew it, in about you know, a week or so, we had this concept that was not a bed and breakfast. This was an airbed and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's really awesome. So we make this website in uh, just a week or so. Uh, we put it out there, and uh, nobody knew it existed, first of all. So I remember one night we went to bed, and we emailed all of the, the blogs covering this big conference. I'd never gotten press before. None of us, neither Brian or I, had ever gotten any publicity. The next morning, we wake up, and we are literally on the top of all these very well-led red design blogs. It felt like, like Christmas morning. Like wow. you wake up and you come down and, and oh my God, <laughs> literally the headlines were like, uh, need a place to crash? Uh, Network in your jam jams at Brian and Joe's San Francisco loft <laughs> at the air bed and breakfast. Um, it literally went from this like kind of just idea to suddenly people are talking about it on these international blogs in a matter of like two weeks. Wow. So we had people contacting us from around the world. People sent us their resumes, their design portfolios. One guy tracked down my cell phone number, left me a bunch of voicemails. Uh, so we ended up choosing three guests, Catamol and Michael. They stayed with us for a couple days, and something really special happened. The first is we got to provide hospitality to them. The second is they got to feel like they belonged in San Francisco because we took them around to our favorite restaurants. They met our friends. And the third thing is we became economically empowered as a result. We made about $1,000, and we saved our apartment. Wow. And how long you give him for that to start? It's incredible. Now, so you hear something like that, and people's assumption is, oh, and then it just took off from there. I assume that wasn't quite how it worked out. It took, it took about a month or so, and then it just took off like a rocket ship. It was, <laughs> um, it was <clears throat> quite the opposite of if you build it, they will come. Um, <laughs> we built it, and they didn't come. Uh, it took, took many, many years. And, you know, there's, there's an old saying in the company that we launched five times, but nobody knew. Yeah. <laughs> it was finally the sixth time that people actually picked up on it. And what um, was different? Or was it the accumulation? It, you know, with each time we, we tried a path, we ran into a dead end and we said, well, we're not quitting. Yeah. Well, let's just turn around, come back, and try a different approach. So to give us an example, what was one of the early approaches that didn't work? So well, I mean, the original concept for Airbnb was airbeds for conferences. We thought oh, the whole opportunity was people need to sleep on airbeds when they travel to conferences. And we tried it next for South by Southwest in 2008. And um, we had all of two people stay on the site. <laughs> oh my God. It was, we thought that that was, that was where you go as a tech yes, company right. to, to <laughs> catapult into the atmosphere of the tech world, right? Twitter and Foursquare and all the other greats had started there. So we thought, oh, this is gives us our, our big chance. We're going to relaunch again, and it's just going to take off like a rocket ship. Uh, it did not. And uh, so we, we backpedaled and said, well, maybe this is more about travel. Maybe this isn't about the event. Maybe it's just you want to travel anywhere at any time. So it was around this time that um, uh, 2008, the summer, the biggest story in the summer of 2008, go back with me here for a minute, the presidential election. Barack Obama, John McCain, this was sensational. And everything was gearing up for the Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado. And it was so big, they had to move Obama's DNC speech from the basketball arena to Invesco Stadium to accommodate 100,000 people. The only problem is that Denver has 20,000 hotel rooms. Wow. So we thought, hmm, maybe there's a way we can ride on the coattails of all this publicity to solve this big problem. Literally, the mayor of Denver was saying they're going to open up the city parks so people could camp out. <laughs> they had nowhere to put people. And so we thought, well, maybe we'll just relaunch again. Nobody knew about the other one anyway. So we'll just do it all over again. But this time, we've got a big spotlight on us, and maybe people will actually see it. Yeah. Um, so we, we geared up, and we went from zero to 800 homes in Denver in a matter of four weeks. Wow. And in doing so, people... We started to get publicity. We started with local bloggers in Denver. That became a local city story. 
they sent you know the ABC news to, to video our hosts. And when ABC does something, NBC and all the others do too. Yeah. <laughs> then it became a regional story and then a national story. And uh, we end up doing a live interview with uh, CNN from our living room. Brian and I are sitting next to each other with earbuds in our ear uh, over Skype with uh, CNN. Uh, ended up becoming one of the most watched videos on CNN.com that day. Is that uh, when you also end up coming up with the idea of the cereal? Is that the same time? Oh, boy. <laughs> when you talk about that, too? Because you're um, still trying to make ends meet, right? Well, so let's get to the cereal. Um, <laughs> we launched for the DNC, and that was a magic moment because – at that point, we'd helped a few hundred people stay in Denver, and the numbers shot to the roof. We went from zero to a lot right overnight, and we thought, this is, this is our rocket ship to the moon. Yeah. However, there's not a political convention every weekend, and so things came crashing Sales went up. back down. <laughs> and we entered what's known in startup land as the trough of sorrow. <laughs> right? Which is, you have a product and you market in a market, but there's not a fit yet. Yes. And so there's zero growth. I also call it the Midwest of analytics. <laughs> Perfectly flat for miles. It can last for months, sometimes years. And it's in the trough of SAR that I feel like the only way you can get out of it is just through sheer creativity. So we're deep in the trough and late one night in the kitchen. Brian and I are just trying to keep each other's hopes up at this point, just trying to keep our spirits high. And we start joking, you know, we're called air bed and breakfast. What if we provided, you know, something for our host to give to our guests? What if we gave them breakfast cereal? And it's now October of 2008, at the height, the peak of Obama mania. And we thought, well, what if we made Obama cereal? Well, why not? That would be called Obama O's. <laughs> right? The breakfast of change. <laughs> You hope. <laughs> and we thought, well, <laughs> we're, we're a nonpartisan company, so we need something for McCain. Well, maybe that's Captain McCain's. <laughs> He's a captain in the Navy, it turned out. And uh, the tagline would be a maverick in every bite. <laughs> so one thing led to another. And at the time, like, I don't even know how we did this. We ended up making boxes of cereal. Did you design them? We did design them. Um, the first thought was, well, let's get on the phone with cereal producers because how do you actually make cereal? I had no idea. Uh, you know, we're designers and tech guys. Like, cereal is kind of a little bit outside of our realm. So I get on the phone. I call Kellogg and General Mills. Um, those conversations were very short. <laughs> <laughs> so I changed tack and I said, well, I'll call local Bay Area cereal manufacturers. They at least listened to the pitch and politely declined. Uh, so then it was back to square one. Okay, how are we going to get cereal? Um, well, cereal is already at the grocery store. Maybe we'll just do that. So we found, uh, we designed the boxes. We found a printer, actually a, a, a RISD graduate who decided to print the boxes at no charge, given that we would pay a commission on every, the sale of every box. God bless him. Um, and we decided we would just put orders up on a website called obamaos.com. And every time an order came in, we'd go to the grocery store, buy a box of cereal off the shelf, <laughs> bring it back to our put apartment. Your, put it in your box. Well, we'd pull the bag out, and we'd put it in our own Obama O's box. <laughs> and oh, but you, it is the best part. You charge 40 bucks for that, right? $40 we did. for a box of cereal. We did. <laughs> So we sent the, um, we had to hot glue each one on the top, by the way. I had so many burned fingers at the end of that. Our kitchen was this production line of breakfast cereal. Um, and we all, Brian and I often looked at each other like, did Mark Zuckerberg ever do this when he was making Facebook? Like, this just seems a little far afield here. Um, so we sent the boxes out to all the press media that we could think of. Um, and it ended up getting on all the morning shows and all, a bunch of uh, publications, Fast Company, Wall Street Journal. And, and CNN again called us back. It was like, wow. this is awesome. We want to cover you guys. They did this live interview, and we sold out of Obama's within a couple of days. <laughs> so $40 a box, and we sold 500 boxes. We made That's 20 a lot of trips to the grocery store. <laughs> yes, it was. You should have seen the look on the cashier's face every time. We just <laughs> clear the shelf. I had three shopping carts of O's. <laughs> going through the thing. I tried to explain to her, you know, we're this tech company, we're making breakfast cereal, air bed and breakfast. And she was like, oh. and eventually I just learned the line. I'm like, we run a bed and breakfast. 
<laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> So, um, but it actually gave you some cash to keep yourself above well, water, Well, at right? this point, we were so deep in the, in the trench, the Trafasara, we had about $20,000 in credit card debt. Because they understand where we were in the, the life cycle of the company, we had that, that rise for the DNC, and we thought, this is a great time to go raise money. Our numbers are up. Let's go talk to investors. We got introduced to 20 of the, the Silicon Valley's best investors, 10 met us for coffee, uh, uh, or 10 replied to our email, 5 met us for coffee, Zero invested in Airbnb. And we faced every kind of rejection that you could imagine uh, from really you know, incredible people who picked big, big winners. And uh, I learned in that moment that rejection is an invitation. Rejection is an invitation to keep going. Mm, that's what we got. <laughs> and as everyone up here knows, you can accept it or, or not. Right? Yes. It's up to you as an entrepreneur to say, like, awesome, thanks for the invitation, I accept it, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. So here we are, uh, we kept going to the tune of um, raising a round of money, we um, lightheartedly call it the visa round, <laughs> <laughs> though uh, I don't think visa knew about it, um, and we maxed out a bunch of credit cards, we had baseball card folders, instead of baseball cards, we actually had credit cards in it, <laughs> and... Um, I don't know if I recommend that or not. It was very high anxiety, very high stress to wake up every morning. So all this to say that we made cereal, not with zero budget, but with negative $20,000 budget. <laughs> but you and paid off the 20000 with the so cereal. The just cereal just got us back to zero, which was great. <laughs> I have a hand for that. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, when you hear about various businesses initially, especially with the changes we've had in the last 20, 25 years of the web, is, you know, a lot of things just sound crazy in the beginning, like you can't. And part of that is like, whether it be shoes or glasses, I need to have an experience of it, right? And you're asking people to have a stranger come stay in their home that they don't know, could be psychotic, right? Or the people I'm going to their home could be psychotic. I, I can see how investors might hesitate before you prove that. But let's just talk about trust, because what all three of you have done and what I attempt to do, and I think all great entrepreneurs are, are really doing, is, is finding a way to add more value so consistently that you know it isn't just a sales pitch, that th these people will deliver for me consistently. And it builds that trust, and that's what builds raving fans. How do you build trust to connect people who don't know each other and where we as a society are constantly taught, don't trust a stranger, but invite them in your house and sleep with them or something like that. <laughs> you know, You're exactly us. right. I mean, the, all those conversations. Was that the biggest obstacle? What, was that the, outside of well, economics? Our biggest obstacle was a bias that we've all been taught since we were kids. Yes. That strangers equal danger. Perfect. Perfect description. We had to overcome... <laughs> Someone not likes danger out there, clearly. <laughs> So, I mean, we had to overcome not only marketplace dynamics and all the, you know, points of a startup, but we also had to figure out how to overcome an age-old bias that's yes. been ingrained in all of us. And the only way, you know, that I can sum it up is that we, because there were other companies like ours in 2008. We weren't the only, the only people out there. So, besides... That was a question I want to ask. Were, oh. you first, were you first online selling glasses? Uh, we weren't the very first. You weren't the very first. Okay, um, cool. We were, we were the only ones to get oh. scale, though. Okay, got it. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. So, well, no, no. We had... Uh, uh, there was many, many competitors, many players at our same level. And so, it begs the question, you know, luck and timing aside, which there's plenty, why did ours eventually take off? And I look back and I think you know, all things being equal, what we fell back on is design. That was our background, right? That's what we knew, like how to design an experience. And when, you, when I say design, I want to clarify that because it's not the look and feel of something. It's the whole experience. It's the whole end-to-end -end experience, yeah. what you get so yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, and so we just applied the same way that, that you think about, you know, a soul cycle experience or Warby Parker retail experience. We thought, well, what's the end-to-end -end experience that we want for our guests and for our hosts. Yes. And through that, how do we find where trust is the lowest and inject that with personality, inject that with reputation, inject that with good design? Mm -hmm. Yes. Tell us some of the ways you did that. How did you, first of all, reputation management was a huge part of it. Yes, give a hand for sure. Yeah. How did you break through that barrier? What were the steps that you guys took to, to, to get it where people all over the world, a million people were willing to go and stay in people's homes on New Year's? Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we learned very quickly that uh, uh, 
proper reputation system was key to building trust. Okay. Right? Making sure that there was a system in place so that people could openly and honestly talk about their experience in such a way where, as with every review that got added to the site, it made it that much more possible for somebody who was resisting the idea to be like, oh, there's 12 people kind of like me who had a great experience. Yeah, I'll give this a shot. So enough social proof. Because normally I think you talked about the fact that people only wanted to visit with somebody they liked. They look at the picture or try and get something of that nature. Is, is, is that true? Can you clarify that for me? Well, I think what's important is that uh, when there's an exchange back and forth that uh, people who open up a little bit more about themselves than usual uh, end up creating that connection, right? Mm-hmm. If, if somebody uh, just messaged somebody and said, yo, yeah. they didn't get much of a response back. And actually what we've learned through the data that is if, if they message with you know, a really long rambling thing like, oh, let me tell you about the issues I have with my mother. Um, people <laughs> also, come stay at your house. <laughs> also didn't reply. There's that kind of like sweet spot of exchange um, of like, hey, love the art on your walls. I'm coming for vacation with my family. Yeah. So finding that sweet spot and helping uh, coach people as they're moving through our system to uh, how to communicate with each other. What, um, once you figured out the reputation management, was that enough to break down that entire concern or fear, or did you have to do other things in the design? I wish. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the first four years of the company were pretty dismal. A lot of people don't know that. Maybe they look at the company and say, wow, what an overnight success it was. We've been doing this for over nine years now, and the first three to four years were absolutely just some of the the most difficult, most painful years of my entire life trying to figure these these dynamics out Mm. of how do you make it comfortable to say yes to letting a stranger in your home. So I'd say another principle that we had that we employed through design was the principles of fun and friendly. Mm. How do we make sure that our design language, our copy, even our colors, um, the the typography, every nuance and detail communicate a sense of fun and friendliness, right? Mm. We couldn't sit, sit next to somebody and be like, well, of course you can trust this. We've had this many thousands of people do it. Uh, uh, you know, it works for these different reasons. We need to design to fill our shoes and actually communicate that on our behalf. All three of you have really worked on design as a competitive edge. I mean, certainly designing the environments in SoulCycle, obviously the glasses. Mm-hmm. And is design really a, a giant competitive edge in any business, or was it in just your businesses from your perspective? I'm asking you. I know what the answer is going to be. (laughs) But tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about design so that someone who maybe isn't thinking in your light can think about how can I design a greater experience for my clients? How do you think about it? I think design is a consideration for the end customer, Mm. right? At every moment, not just at the website moment or or the time you open the door to to the store. Um, It's it's really like, you know, you take like like a, a water bottle here. Let me grab this real quick. So like, Design isn't just the water bottle. Design is thinking about, okay, what's someone's first experience when they hear the name of this brand? How do I want to design that? What's your experience uh, in the store when they see this on the shelf for the first time? What's your experience when they get home and that first sound that happens when I click the lid? What's the first experience where I, I taste what, my product, what the product is like? Going through the whole cycle, what's the experience of where this goes after its life? How does this make sure it fits back into an ecosystem materially? And you, you, design is considering all of those moments along the way. Very much like you did for the cushions you described to us earlier, like looking at every stage. You, you kind of observe what they really do and then make your modifications from that if there needs to be modifications for them to become more excited about it. Tell us about capital and expanding the business. I mean, here you are, you have a $30 billion valuation. I think Marriott has got a $20 billion valuation. <laughs> They're around 104, 105 years, you're around nine years. Um, you don't have any hotel rooms. You and I were talking <laughs> offline, you were saying, you know, we don't compare ourselves to hotels. Tell us about capital and tell us about why are you not a hotel? What's the difference? Why, why, what is the real pull from your perspective? You've alluded to it, but I'd love to hear it even more explicitly. Well, I think, you know, we consider ourselves a part of what's called the sharing economy. And yes. there's been a lot of definitions of what that means. I'll define it for you here, which is, to me, the sharing economy is commerce with the promise of human connection. I mm, love that. If you, if you called it... Yeah, that, that deserves a hand for sure. Thanks. I think if you called it the rental economy, it would be incomplete because people share something about themselves, mm. right? And we have got you know, plenty of stories to back that up about how people go above and beyond to make sure that you feel welcome when you're in their home. Um, 
So for us, you know, uh, the thing about our company is that <laughs> it's not actually a new idea. Because if you go back a couple of generations and you ask your grandparents how they traveled when they were kids, yes. they wouldn't tell you hotels. Yes. They tell you farmhouses, yeah. bed and breakfast, inns, yeah. staying with people in their homes. Yes. So we like to think that all we've done is bring you know, the way that people used to travel back using technology. And when it comes to financing that, you know, the, the power of the internet is, is you know, insane in that you can reach so many people so quickly. Um, and for a, a travel company, that's incredibly important for us to be everywhere all at once. You know, if you put up a search bar, you, you better have products on the shelf when people go and search for a city. Right. So for us, ex expansion and growth very quickly was, was absolutely important, not just for the sake of growth, but to make sure we had community all over the world. So when you want to travel somewhere, we had options for you. And part of the beauty uh, is the experience of someone taking you through their hometown. Like you described that. You took them to your friends. You took them to the local bar. They aren't, as, as your ad describes, right? You're not going and traveling there. You're going and experiencing it there. But there have got to be some hiccups along the way with the number of people that you're dealing with. How do you deal with the crazy-ass host? <laughs> How do you deal with the crazy guest? I mean, it's got to happen. How often does it happen? How do you deal with it? Or what, if it doesn't happen as often, why not with that many types of numbers? I'm not sure which one's real. Well, we've done right now um, over 130 million guest stays wow. globally. That's <laughs> incredible. That's incredible. And the number and of... And only 129 million were really... <laughs> 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 well, less than a fraction of a percent have been problematic. Wow. Um, and well, why do you think that is? I think that there's something that changes when you enter somebody's home. There's, so you think the guests themselves, they know they're entering somebody's home, and so we all have a different set of filters? I think there's some universal principles of hospitality. No matter what culture you're in, where you are in the world, there are some sometimes ancient kind of laws of hospitality going back to Greek culture or um, some old Indian culture uh, uh, around At Atiti Devo Baha, which is the guest mm -hmm. is God. Yes. There's Pashtun Wali in um, Pakistan. Um, and there's these kind of ancient codes of ethics of how yes. to treat other people in your home that I think are still a part of us today. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Let's go for some questions. Let's start with questions here for Joe, and then we'll go for the group as a whole. How about uh, this young lady back here? Yes, ma'am. I'm Megan Draper from Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> Hello. First of all, this is my very first Tony Robbins experience, and I'm like, it's like love at first sight. I'm in. I'm ready. This is amazing. <laughs> So my question for you with the Airbnb is, I'm an avid NPR listener, and they just um, had a story about people renting each other's washing and like washing machines, washers and dryers while they're not home. Um, so there's this huge market. It sounds like from your experience with Airbnb being so successful, that there's a huge market for people wanting to use your stuff while you're not using it, right? So even in your ad, you know, you didn't ever show. Uh, the the homes or the, like you were showing all the people you know so I think that's amazing that the company is all about people and connecting with people so my question is you know what's next are people going to start renting out their lawnmowers while you're not using them like well, you know what what do you what do you see coming next well, thank you for your question um, I think that there is this this ideal in the, that that we've unlocked or been a part of unlocking which is that there's a lot of stuff in the world that sits idle. There's a lot of idle resources that go to waste every single day. And there's literally, since 2008, there are thousands of companies that have started leveraging principles of the sharing economy of how to bring people together around those underutilized assets or, or rooms or cars or lawnmowers or tools. Um, and I, I've had the fortune of seeing these companies when I, when I get to travel. Um, I have to share one of the most interesting ones that I saw that was culturally relevant was uh, in Korea. Uh, which is, I think, very far ahead in regards to the sharing economy. The city of Seoul actually has a department just focused on bringing the sharing economy principles into the infrastructure of how they run wow. the city government. Wow. Uh, but there's actually a, a startup in Seoul <laughs> that connects people who are applying for a job with people who have nice suits in their closet. Wow. <laughs> because in their culture, that's a really important thing is that you go in with a very nice suit, but it's kind of a catch-22. If I don't have a job, maybe I can't afford the suit. So there's actually a sharing economy company that connects you around something that's just sitting idle in your closet. So I, I sure hope that there's more entrepreneurs around the world that are spotting local opportunities in cities or countries that they can connect 
uh, you know, guest and host with, you know, things that, that people really need. Beautiful. Thank you. All the way back in the red shirt. All the way back there. Yes, sir. Great service. Uh, Airbnb is awesome. We've used it several times. Thank you. Um, it's actually was life changing for somebody who uh, we were allowing to rent one of our properties out and she was making some money. Um, she had cystic fibrosis. Um, she got her lung transplant. Um, it was really cool. Very nice. And then we got the letter in the mail from the city of Monterey saying, no, 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 no. You can't do that. Um, so that's been our experience and a big problem. How are you dealing with that, and what's the future of the regulations? It's a great question. Um, I think there's a number of companies, in addition to ours, that have stewarded technologies or new software systems into um, cities or civic settings that uh, don't move as quickly right, yep. as the internet or as the technology does. Um, so there's always going to be catch-up. Uh, the Uber effect, do. right? It's like sure. You've seen it then probably as much as anyone. So I think w what we've learned is that when we can sit down with cities and explain what it is that we do, how it benefits the, the constituents of that city, and ultimately through some practical matters like tax revenue, how it actually benefits the city, um, they're very willing to listen. Um, and there are a lot of cities around the world who, who are getting it, um, Paris and London, uh, a lot of cities throughout the U.S., uh, Asia, and, and Europe. Um, so I think there's, there's still some work to do in certain parts of the world, but like the genie's out of the bottle. This is, is an idea whose time has come. 130 million people have said yes. Um, I don't think we're going back to the way that it was, so what's important to us is that we work collaboratively with cities to help them understand and then figure out some of the details together. Great. One more for here. Yes, ma'am, right here in the black. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm a big fan of all of you, uh, especially you because I'm also from San Francisco in tech. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a user experience researcher, and I'm sure you know exactly what it is. And uh, my background is tech and science. And uh, the reason I'm here, this is my, pretty much my first exposure to business. Um, I've come up with a cutting edge type of user experience um, type of research where I am reading the minds, um, measuring their brain waves, and also connecting that to their emotional uh, states. And um, this is something that I'm also working on my dissertation, which is I'm done hopefully in a, in a few months, um, uh, in the field of neuroinformation science. Now, my question is, I really look up to you guys who um, sort of have this idea, have this gut feeling that I also have. Um, and you quit your job <laughs> and you do that. And I've been struggling with this um, uh, sort of decision whether do I trust this gut feeling and actually go for it? Um, I don't need a lot of capital. All I need is a um, kick-ass laptop. Everything else is in my own head and I've established a whole research plan, everything, and also the data analysis of the neuroscience path. Um, and I know that there's a market for it because when I give talks, people are very responsive. Um, but a part of me is also has this insecurity thinking, well, I really don't know much about a business. And also, I'm more of an artist that we did a practice here. We were with either artists or, you know, and I'm, and I'm that. So how did you pick took that sort of big step to actually um, quit your job <laughs> and, and do that, because I think that's huge. I, that's totally laudable. I mean, I, I love that. But I just feel insecure um, knowing in my gut feeling that this is an idea and there is a market for it, because also a lot, we've talked a lot about user research and, and all that, and I'm actually going to give businesses their emotional states. I'm actually going to read their minds and tell them what's going on. But... Um, to really take that big leap, big step, I guess. Um, if you could speak to that, that would be awesome. And it'd be nice to hear from all three of you if you wouldn't share. Sure, it's a, it's a brilliant question, and it's never easy. Like, it's never like, cool, let's do this. Now's the time. <laughs> yeah, I have no insecurities about this. Let's just do this. Like, <laughs> said no one ever. Like, uh, <laughs> of, of course, there's all kinds of doubts, and oh my God, like, wh what if, what if, what if? Um, at a certain point, um, uh, I think that uh, it, it, there wasn't like this kind of like one moment of like, 
oh shit, this is going to happen. I think it was a sequence of moments. Um, and looking back before, you know, I quit my job, I could look back and tell you all the things that I did that were like baby steps, like practicing that, like doing something risky, like getting outside my comfort zone, like finding different ways to kind of stretch myself and nudge myself a little bit further. So by the time it came, you know, to make that decision, I'd sort of like tuned the muscle of like, okay, well, I looked behind me and it's like, well, those 20 things that I did over the last year that I felt uncomfortable about or like all those insecurities that I was kind of like, okay, I'm, letting, I'm stepping one step at a time. It's kind of like, cool. Well, that's behind me. Then this is just literally the next step. So I think looking for opportunities every, like in daily life to just do something that makes you uncomfortable. Whenever you get that same feeling that you're feeling right now, when you're at the checkout counter or on the phone with a friend or browsing a website, find a way to just kind of like, like challenge it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I, just to add to that a little bit, when we were starting Warby Parker, um, first thing was that we were full-time students, so we weren't foregoing a salary. I think it would have been a, a very bold and risky move if we quit our jobs to immediately um, go after this opportunity without some proof. Uh, and in fact, uh, right, we were in graduate school. It was a two-year MBA program. Uh, but while I was working on Warby Parker between my first and second year during the summer, I actually worked at McKinsey. So I had a backup plan. Um, and I actually had a full-time offer to go to McKinsey, but then Warby Parker took off, so I stayed with, with, with Warby Parker. So I, the, the reason why I highlight that is um, I think there's this perception that successful people take these crazy leaps of faith that, um, and, and jump out of planes without parachutes. Uh, and I think nothing could be further uh, from the truth. You should think about um, when you're about to take that leap of faith, um, can you take a step back and break down that decision into a bunch of smaller ones and scale down uh, the, the, the mountain, so to speak? Mm -hmm. um, that, there's a, a great book called The Originals that profiles a, a, a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs about how do you de-risk um, uh, uh, certain ideas. Um, and again, going back to our story, right? we had this idea sell glasses online. Um, we did a bunch of customer research before we started investing money in it. Then we sort of said, we're going to invest this amount. Um, what do we need to continue to invest more money and time into this idea? And I break it down into a process like that. It's also like uh, we talked about the other day about the greatest investors in the world are obsessed with asymmetrical risk reward. They're not going out and taking giant risks. The 50 billionaires that I interviewed, virtually maybe two of them did something of that nature. 48 of them were all saying, how do I take the least amount of risk for the greatest reward? Which if you listen and watch all these heads bouncing here, that really is the secret. Because taking too many large risks, no matter who you are, you're going to find yourself in a challenge. Even Richard Branson's a dear friend of mine, and, and Richard is one of the most crazy human beings in the world, taking giant risks with his life, but not in business. <laughs> he'll take it with his life. He'll get in a balloon. He'll, get, he'll do anything, right? He was the other, not a few weeks ago, he's mountain biking, almost got killed. He's just crazy as hell. But his first question in business is, how do we protect the downside? Always. Uh, he was sharing with me that when he built Virgin, which he just sold Virgin America, by the way, um, it's Alaska Airlines, I guess, in the last week or two here. But when he originally built Virgin, he literally took two years, very much in a similar thing, and his biggest piece was, where is my biggest risk? Well, it's buying these frickin' planes from Boeing. So he literally took two years and negotiated a deal that if in the first three years he went out of business, he could return the planes and have no limitation, no cost, no liability. So no downside, only upside. And that mindset is probably the smartest mindset I've found economically, and business is economics as much as is our emotion and our psyche and the people. It's also the financial structure that makes sense that's there too. Did you want to add anything to this as well? I, I just want to echo what Neil said. You know, when I started uh, working with SoulCycle, I had a full-time gig over at Equinox, and I was so in love with it, and I was so passionate about the opportunity. I was figuring out a way to do both, and I think what Neil said is really smart. You've got sort of one plan, and it sounds like you're so passionate, and you're so clear on where the opportunity is. How can you kind of work your way along both, and then figuring out what those checkpoints are of where you sort of, you know, you go in, and like I, I went in, and I just said, that's it. 
I'm giving this 16 hours, and I'm giving you 10 hours, so now I need to be over doing this. And can you work your way up to it? Because the passion that I hear that you have for this and the clarity that you have around the opportunity in front of you, I think it would be a complete shame to let those insecurities dominate your mind and not start, start to take some of those steps. Cool. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much, Tony, for this. This is amazing. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Three more questions. They can be for anybody here. We'll wrap up. All right. Yes, sir. Right here. So I have a question with Airbnb. I'm kind of dealing with a uh, app-based platform myself where I've got two groups of people, um, professional athletes and trainers and the end users. And one of the things that we're dealing with is quality control. Um, you know, being that, you know, Airbnb is about renting out the, uh, um, you know, the rooms and whatnot, the design aspect is one of the most critical thing as, as the end user. Um, so being that you can't be at all the places, uh, how do you really monitor that, that the ones that are uploading the photos and, you know, making sure that everything's in frame and, you know, it looks great and it's appealing, uh, how... How do you monitor that with all the, you know, the photos coming in uh, to the platform? Yeah, that's a great question, especially when you have to do this in 191 countries <laughs> and all those different cultures and cities. Um, we learned a couple of things. The first was we created hospitality standards. So creating the nine standards, and I wouldn't call them rules so much as I would call them guidelines of how to coach people through how to set up your house, how to welcome a guest, how to respond quickly, all these things that you need to make a marketplace work and to provide a great experience. That was a little bit more obvious. The second one was less obvious. And this came through, I think, just looking at a site in the early days and seeing how our early hosts didn't quite know how to take a great photo. Let's just say that. Um, and so the places that we had weren't that desirable to want to even stay in. And so nobody was booking them. Surprise. And we thought, well, gee, we're, we're design guys. I've done photography my whole life. What if we just rented a camera went to our biggest market at the time it was in New York and just took photos at no charge. And so we did exactly that. We went to New York, rented a camera, went door to door throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, we'd email the host in advance and say, hey, um, co-founder, love to come by tomorrow. And we have a professional photographer too. And then you'd knock on the door and be like, hi, I'm Joe. And I'm also the photographer. And <laughs> they'd kind of be like, what? What's going on here? Founder photographer. Uh, um, we, we'd take these photos, and um, a couple of things happened. The first is that talk about building trust with your customers. Um, never before had anyone met somebody from a website they signed up for to come take free photos of their place so they could get more bookings. Um, and uh, uh, a couple of things happened. First is that people started booking rooms because you could actually see what it was you're paying for. And the second thing is through these interactions with these early adopters, it built up so much love with our early community that they started telling everybody about us. When you love something, when you love a brand, you tell your friends about it, uh, your neighbors, your coworkers, your colleagues. And we started to see our, our, our organic growth go up in New York. We had no ads, no online marketing, no press at this time. We couldn't even afford it. Um, and so there was a really valuable lesson there, this idea of, of find a hundred people who absolutely love you is more important than finding a million people that kind of like you, right? So going really deep and creating this strong connection with the early adopters, in, in your case, with, with your marketplace.
uh, can usually inform you about, uh, uh, about the quality levers and checks that are specific to your platform and, and your community. Thank you. Very nice. Couple more. How about... Yes, how about Ms. Corder? Thank you. My name is Puneet from Pembroke Pines, Florida. And Tony, thank you for a great event and all three of you. Um, thank you for coming and sharing your experiences. So first and foremost, and I think you all can answer to this, is you have created a niche in your respective markets. You have pioneered a new way of, you know, so for your Airbnb, you have created a whole new market where people are using their properties or investment properties as just to do Airbnb or rent it out and make a new income. So how do you go from there? Uh, we talked about adding value. How do you take that to the next level? And, uh, and how do you guys kind of within your own organizations, how do you try to put yourself out of business on a day-to-day -day basis kind of thing to fight those forces coming across, let's say a competitor or some economic change or what have you? I'd love to add to that in that same frame. What's next for all three of you? You guys have built businesses that are such incredible role models. What's next as well? Who wants to go first? I mean, for, for us, we've been so focused over the last years on just opening in as many markets as we can because we can't satisfy the demand for the product with the portfolio that we have. And so for us, what I'm most excited about, we're opening our first international location in Toronto um, in March, which is really exciting. And in unbelievably huge endeavor for our organization. I think we, fantastic. <laughs> I see a flag over here. Um, so we, we are really focused right now on our core business growth, our international growth, because we are such a young company and we know how much demand is out there. But I really challenge our team every day. I say all this all the time. We're a company of micro innovation more than we are macro innovation. So how do we up the experience every time so that riders who have been riding with us for eight years, nine years, who are still coming in two or three times a week, how are we evolving the experience for them? And whether that's in the actual workout and different types of training that we're doing in the room or different elements within the studio experience, we're trying to introduce two or three new things every single year so that people continue to be surprised and delighted as they're coming into the experience. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, you know, in terms of uh, trying to put myself uh, out of business, so to speak, is that I'm always trying to limit the number of direct reports that I have. So that's uh, something that I'm constantly looking at. And how can I hire somebody with uh, more expertise in a particular area that may um, complement perhaps weaknesses that, that I have? So that's always top of mind. In terms of Warby Parker, as we think about growth, uh, again, it's all about this holistic experience. So right, we're a direct consumer, vertically integrated brand. So we can either go farther down the supply chain or up farther up the value chain to, to customers. So something that's happened in the last week is that we've opened up our first optical lab. So this is light manufacturing uh, that we're doing about an hour outside of New York City, uh, a 34,000 square foot facility we just opened. We're going to hire 130 people. Um, and it's where, um, thank you, it's super exciting. Um, it's where we cut the lenses, insert them into the frames, and the primary motivation here is the customer experience. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's going to allow us to get product to customers in the New York metro area faster, which is increasingly more important. It ensures that Warby Parker hands are the last hands uh, touching product. If we want to put personalized notes, we'll be able to. Um, and of course, it helps with gross margin. But again, it's those first two other pieces that are the primary impact. The other thing that we're doing as, as you go farther up the, um, the sort of value chain is think about how um, we interact with our customers and where are their friction points. The two biggest pain points for people buying glasses is having a valid uh, prescription um, and selecting the right frame for someone's face. So now uh, we have 46 stores across the country. We're going to open uh, another 25 this year. Um, so now there's more options for people to, to go into to stores. We're starting to do 3D renderings of people's faces so that way we can create optimal fit frameworks and better recommend frames for, for individuals. Uh, we're thinking a lot about eye exams and technology. Um, Getting an eye exam today is a major pain. Most uh, optometry practices, the hours of operations are not convenient for people that work. The cost is high. Uh, what if you were able to get your prescription by doing a simple eye test on your iPhone? Um, that's something that excites us um, and we think will happen uh, in, in the near future. Well, I've got two answers to your question. Um, the first is 
uh, I think, at a certain scale to be intentional about it. So we've set up a team inside the company called Samara, which I've put together to help think about what are the next seeds for Airbnb. I think, you know, as a hospitality company living in a world of tech, you constantly have to be thinking about what's next because the industry just moves so quickly. There's this famous list of uh, 10 tech companies that were the hottest companies in the 90s, nine of which you've never heard of anymore because maybe they got a little bit too entrenched in the business of today without thinking about the business of tomorrow. Um, so for us, that means expanding from the home to the entire trip. So the future of Airbnb is uh, imbuing our values of community, guest host, of design from the home experience to what does the whole trip experience look like? How can we help with the transportation all the way through to answering the question, what do I do when I'm, once I'm there? So that's, I think, what we're doing at scale. Maybe something more uh, applicable to anybody at any scale would be talk to customers. Like, that's what we did in the early days is talking to our community, staying connected to our hosts and guests is a, such a pure source of, of information for us. Um, we can piece things together that we might not otherwise spot on our own, but by talking and staying connected to our community, they often tell us things that we never would have thought of. For example, we had hosts who wanted to offer experiences to guests when they traveled to a certain city. So if you go to um, like Park City, Utah, a, a host would take you skiing on trails, <laughs> skiing on trails that only the host knew about, like the locals go on. Um, I stayed in Costa Rica one time on our site, and the host took me surfing and gave me free surf lessons because he's a uh, retired pro professional surfer. Um, and so we sort of saw like, how hosts were wanting to offer these experiences, but there was no way to actually organize it. They were kind of putting it in their, the, the listing of their home. It was very hard. So eventually we've pulled it out now, and there's a whole new service of just around experiences. And that really the lineage of that goes back to listening to our community. If you think about it, there's two businesses you've always got to be managing, the business you're in and the business you're becoming. If you're only managing the business you're in, there's no future and you're going to get eclipsed by somebody who innovates. If you manage the business you want to be and you don't manage the business you're in, you're going to have a cash flow problem. And I really think all businesses have to be thinking about that constantly to be able to grow and achieve. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins and Mary Buckheit. Annie Org is our editorial director and occasional host. The podcast is produced by Carrie Song and Tyler Culbertson. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Special thanks to Diane Adcock for her creative review. Copyright Robbins Research International.